Okay, you are two minutes early. Yeah? Yeah. That's a little fast. Oh, yeah. So, would you like me to stop? No, no, I'm just in case I didn't know if it was. It's 859. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we did it. Ah, okay. I love being a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that you? Don't hold that. I know. I didn't say. <laughs> okay. Thank All right. You approve the uh, number three, folks. Approve the minutes. I'll take the motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Second. Gotcha. Uh, All <laughs> in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Okay. Public comment. Oh, good. We have Rita. Hi, Rita. Um, Blair, is there anybody for public comment? No. Okay. Hearing no public comments, we will go on to receipt of information from supervisors not needed. The only one is you, and you're not going to. Okay. No. Nope. All right. Number five. Uh, we'll have a child support update. Thank you. Hey, come on up here and sit up here where you get into trouble. He doesn't want to, to be well. Well, I hate icons. <laughs> 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 so this is again Nikki Ewing Vitalis, the child support director. This is the second time she's presented, so I'm standing up here for moral support. Mm -hmm. There isn't much to report since I was here last time in August. Uh, our goal was to have everyone go to conference this year, but due to county issues, uh, only half of us were able to go. So that was uh, October 10th, 11th through the 14th. It was good for our new staff because uh, this year's conference was geared toward the new uh, people coming in new attorneys, new directors, many of the people that were in child support are now retiring. So it's a lot of younger people coming in. I think it was uh, very beneficial for our new staff that gave them to see what child support was about, to learn more of the history of child support. And it also gives everyone that great network. You have contacts across the state now that you could use as a resource. Um, thanks to Malia for drafting and doing the budget. You helped me out a lot. <laughs> we took a lot off me. It was, it was a team effort of, I don't know, what do you want to do? I don't know, what should we do? <laughs> but we got it. And lastly, I just want to end with our numbers. The fiscal year, we ended with our percentages just below the state which I think was really good considering we have all new staff and people didn't we're just getting in the groove. Uh, this year we're starting out with already meeting two of the state mandates in the performance category. So we're over that 80% mandate starting out. I can only see that this is going to improve. Yeah, so what what the mandates are, performance measures. How fast do we get a court order? How fast do we get a father's name on a birth certificate for a child born to unmarried parents? How fast are we getting arrears payments when a parent falls behind? Um, so these are all things that the state judges 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 us on, and then provides us funding based upon those performance measures. Now we've always been really good at paternity and getting fathers. Names on birth certificates. We've always been okay at court order rate, but what we've done now with this new staff, I mean, we've got nearly all brand new staff within the last year and a half, two years. And yet our numbers are higher now than they were four years ago when we had Susan. <laughs> and maybe that's because there was some complacency and people started just doing things the way they had always been done. But with Nikki, uh, when she was a specialist, she was our top performing specialist 
And so now as the director, she's been training in all of these new people. So they do things the way she would do things, which is getting us higher performance measures. That means when families are on benefits, public assistance, we're getting court orders for that non-custodial parent, that absentee parent, to pay in money into that health. So we're actually helping families here in Polk County at a higher rate, and our agency is being recognized because we're going to end up getting more performance funding in. So it might sound kind of mundane to say we're meeting our performance goals, but it's huge for us, and I'm really proud. Thank you. Um, Nick, you mentioned on this conference that yeah. you had trouble getting people to. What is what can we do? Is there anything we can help with getting something different so that you can get more of your staff to these conferences if they're if they're value added and good for the new folks? Is there anything we can do to help get in there? It's an annual conference that we try. We've always opened it up because the cost of the county is minimal. The cost um, we have to pay about 34 cents per dollar to send our folks there. So the rest of it is covered um, from that state and federal funding. So it really is a good bang for your buck. But this year, both of the attorneys were gonna go, I usually get most of my continuing legal education credits from a conference like this. So when I can't go, then I have to try to figure out other places to try to get that in. This year, it just didn't work out with, you could only send one of us and, and, and I said, Joe, you're the primary child support attorney in our office, you go. And I'll try to get my CLE to other places. And that wasn't an agency issue. That was all the other stuff in the county mm -hmm. issue. Um, and then some of our some of our staff just didn't have kind of the there were other family, family issues. So it wasn't a county wasn't allowing it or didn't create the space for it. Life is right now. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, number seven. Carol, can we switch seven and eight? We're waiting for one more person for our panel. <laughs> okay. Is that okay? Yeah. So we'll do number eight. Update. Uh, CSP strategic plan admission division value. That's me. You get my hands. So, can I apologize? You know, for not having it on a flash drive for you, you'll just have to listen real intently and I can email it to you later. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys an update on some work that we've been doing in the division on updating our mission, vision, and values, along with our strategic plan because they all tie together. Um, so over the past summer-ish, and into the spring, um, our leadership team did some really heavy duty work on redefining um, mission, vision, and values. Um, so as you know, we were restructured um, back in 2015 through the budget process starting in 2016. So we're a pretty new organization here. Um, it combined public health, Department of Children and Families, behavioral health, um, along with the medical examiner. We used to be human services and, and public health. Um, now we function as community services division. So with that, um, looking at the mission, you know, we why do we have a mission? It defines our social value we create, is the reason why we exist, and is a starting point for our plan. So it rolls right into our strategic plan. Um, so formerly we had oh, about one, two, three, four, five different mission statements for the different departments within the division. So community services had an overarching one that was probably just kind of thrown together. Um, Behavioral health had their own, DCF had theirs, public health, and then economic support maintains their own. They continue to maintain their own because they are that separate Penn County consortium. Um, but we felt like it was important to hear and know what they were saying in there. Um, so we took all of that and um, worked with a consultant to have offsite for a day and streamline into one. We really believe that we function as one organization as the division, community services division. Um, so the, the crunching down of all of those mission statements and a lot of discussion by leaders was that our new mission for all minus um, Great Rivers, they still have theirs, but they, they will um, have this as the CSD part of their mission statement, is partnering with our community to promote and pr protect health and well-being. So 
we believe that through that statement, through all of the departments in our division, we can cover the services that we deliver in that one statement. So the next page, um, we need a vision, right? Where we want to be. Um, former vision statements, we can read those. We had five different vision statements. So we were all kind of doing our own thing. Um, new vision is a safe and healthy community for all. In whatever work. Um, next slide is the vision. And I did this on purpose because it's really micro tiny and you can't even read it, right? Because we have so many different vision vision words and the, the principles that we hold important. important. Um, so this is where we, um, as a leadership team, we came up with the words that were important to us in our vision, our values, sorry. I have a typo there. This was done like 10 minutes before I came here. Mm -hmm. um, it is the values. So, um, we worked on defining those words with our staff. So we did breakout sessions at our last all staff meeting and had the staff help us um, define what those words meant to us. We have empowerment, integrity, accountability, prevention, equity, excellence, collaboration and partnership, and compassion. So together with our staff, we um, put those meanings behind those words. So we're all bought in and we all believe the same thing. Um, so for the future, we'll be working with our marketing specialist on, on branding this and getting it out. Um, but then I think more importantly is how it rolls into our strategic plan. So when we take all of that, um, what I just talked about, mission, vision, and values, we look at just coming up on our new strategic plan cycle for 2023 through 2025. We're going to build on the previous strategic plan that because of the pandemic, we didn't have a ton of time to work on it. Um, so we're carrying over some stuff, refreshing and relaunching in 2023. So we look at that lean model, um, focusing on our people, the culture, uh, purpose, um, what products do we have, what services are we delivering, and then process and systems. Um, so some of the highlights right now are improving our communication, re increasing retention, building trust, um, develop, developing a provider network um, so we can get out of our crisis box way of doing business and needing services all the time that aren't here. We want to look at having a, a robust um, provider network so when we need services, we can get access to them for the people that we're serving. And then also developing key partnerships within our community and within the county um, departments that we serve. So what we'll do with this is um, all of our staff are going to be involved in this. So it was very easy for me just to come up with some goals, but we talked about it at the leadership level and decided that these are the high points that we want to focus on. We want our staff to tell us what does that mean and set the goals. So we'll have some um, facilitators, work groups, um, defining what the goals are under those broad categories and um, enhancing those, those areas for the next three years. Um, so we have to roll that out, I believe, at our all staff meeting in December. Um, we'll assign facilitators to groups, and we will get working with our, our staff on defining the stuff for us. Yes, ma'am. Smart goals? Yes, we usually try to do it in a smart goal format. Mm -hmm. Smart goal means it's deliverable and then measurable. Specific, yeah. measurable, attainable, realistic. Right. Oh, oh, he's done that before. Oh, I have a question. We got really good input from that feedback from the uh, trauma um, response. Yes, so two of us went to the trauma response and Rita worked up. Oh, and Rita. And then the feedback was really good. Is that going to be? Sort of so that will mostly be in, well, I think it can scatter throughout because we heard a lot about some of it in here. Yeah, so um, that's where we want the staff to be able to yeah. develop those goals. Um, and and embed that feedback that they've given and what they're seeing from you guys. Because it was really good. It was. What do what did you uh, say, Rita? Wait. I say it was. It was very good. What do, do we have examples or what do key partnerships? Well, I have things in my head. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we want to do some partnership with the jail. Um, get some services going in the jail. What that looks like, I don't know exactly. Um, we're looking at some WIC partnerships with other counties. 
um, foster care enhancement with some other counties and our Pulp United group are some of the top ones or places, but they might come up with other partnerships if they want to. So I don't want to say that it's set in stone. Those are things that we're kind of working on right now. The only other one I had was increased, and this is just for my own learning. Like yep. increased retention. What do you write? retention of employee retention? Employee retention. Mm -hmm. Okay. And about I know pulling this right out of thin air. About how many open positions are there today in CSD? Yeah. Um, I don't think we have any right now um but there are some in the works okay new positions they're all new positions most of them are new i believe we're fully staffed if, um, minus a supervisor and public health and we're in the process of interviewing thank you thank you that is incredible because i listened to public safety and the sheriff said we're almost fully staffed there too wow i'm gonna turn around okay all right yeah, I'm okay. I'm gonna hang on to <laughs> Yeah, I think it could also mean um, provider retention too. What are we doing to keep our providers <clears throat> keep them contacting with us? But that's going to be, you know, staff will speak on that too. All right. Okay. So I don't know if our last person, you guys might just have to wing it here for our panel of experts. <laughs> well, you want to come off. You want to go one more, number nine, eight, or you guys have stuff? Yeah. Okay. Who are we even saying? Can I have emailed her several times? Yes. Yeah. Oh, today's date. So, oh, you're not sure. She might not come in. She might not. Okay. Yeah, she's on her way. She was, she was on her way before nine o'clock. Oh, okay. Well, we can, if you're okay with it, then we can move on until she. Okay, so we're going to move to number nine. Is that a budget review update? Oh, that's me again. Yeah, that's there. you. <laughs> 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 my podium back here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need it. Um, I don't have any paper. So um, I just wanted to update on a position that we are adding. So we um, we have I think it's five positions that we had a few in the works and approved last year in last year's budget. We're at that point now where we're able to fill those based on client demand, service demand, um, client service hours, and that. And then um, it threw some of our work with Don when he was in the extension role. We identified um, an area where we could use some more um, management support. The span of control in DCF was just too much. So the, the one, there's two supervisors in that. There's a director and a supervisor, and they have about 24 um, staff. It's too much for one. So what, what was happening is that Lee was not able to get to her director level work because she was providing direct supervision. Um, so we worked with, through the budget and uh, requested a new position add-on DCF manager. Um, so I just wanted to be um, thoughtful in telling you guys that we are adding that position. We have the FTE for it. We also have the budget for it, um, but it is a brand new position. So we felt like you guys should know and um, give both blessings or approval to be able to carry that forward through the budget. Would you like a motion from this committee to the board, full board to support this? Or do you? I don't know. Do we need that? Do we, do we need? Do we? So um, because it's a new position, the board approval is needed. Do you want a motion from us? So not necessary. Um, it, it, Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got it covered in the budget budget resolution as a technical amendment. Okay. So, uh, what does that mean, a technical amendment? Well, it, it's uh, before committees. We uh, so this is back in September and October, we said we have seven step increases. That's from uh, say a level sixteen role to a level seventeen role. Uh, we did not count this DCF position. So that would have taken us to eight. There's yet another one, HR director nine. And so it's just, it's, it's, there's no change to the budget. It doesn't change the numbers in the budget. It doesn't change the FTE count. We've got the dollars to cover it. We're just informing at, at the full board level through the budget resolution, uh, informing the board that this is a technical issue that we've solved uh, in communication to you. 
So I don't know if there's any reason to uh, have a endorsement of any kind. I mean, certainly there could be a, a consensus, but a vote would honestly run the risk of opening up the can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. <laughs> As the fine lady from Amory said, showing. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions about this topic? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll hand it over to my twin brother, Don. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, end of the year financial report. So, uh, is that all right if I pick yeah, that up? Yeah. Go for it. Yep. Sure. So uh, I'm not sure this committee has seen the financial results from 2021. Uh, pretty sure you haven't, because we are uh, very, very late getting our audited. Uh, the part of our audited financial statements, which tells us if we made boo boos putting a credit in the left door instead of in the right door, that kind of thing. Uh, we've got that document now. Because of where we are in the budget process, we haven't had a chance to process it. So some of these things that feel like they've been dragging on are going to drag on just a little bit further. Uh, in December, I think we'll be able to provide the end of the year financial report for 2021. Okay. You'll, you'll, also, um, you'll also have an opportunity uh, through the financial policies of the county to review the 2023 budget. And if you feel like you need to make any amendments to that budget, you could do that. So we hope that you'll take your fiduciary responsibility very seriously. Um, but we also hope that there's not a lot of changes. I didn't like to say that. But you do have the, you do have the, the power to review uh, the departments and agencies that report up to HHS at the first budget meeting after the budget is passed to consider any amendments that you might want to make. So it's sort of a fail safe. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll encumber the next meeting with that discussion. Um, and while I've got the microphone, I'll also mention that we're trying to get into the practice of having a quarterly re a budget review uh, across all the departments and divisions. So uh, and the quarters, since we're calendar based, uh, we'll, uh, we'll see the first end of the year information for 2022, likely in the January meeting. So we'll get well, an initial view of where we stand against the budget year in January, it will be incomplete because we actually don't tie everything off until March. But then sort of a month, with a month lag, quarter by quarter, we'll start that practice of looking to see where we are against the budget. So we did that uh, in October against September at the end of the third quarter of financial. So this is probably a lot of detail, but we're going to keep that practice going okay. if you're interested in us yeah. doing that. Now, obviously, very early in the budget year, it's very difficult to determine which way the ship's going uh, because of the way things get processed. But we just would like to have that opportunity to continually inform you quarter by quarter. So that's another thing that we're adding. You'll get to yeah, that would be good because then if we're not bombarded and we kind of learn your mm -hmm. approach and you know it might take us a while. To and then maybe it won't take a year to review the finals. Yeah. Uh, if, I, if I could, uh, we uh, there's these listservs that county folk get to participate in, so you get a little information about what's going on county by county. The, the auditing firms just got killed this year. They, they, they can't hang on to staff. Uh, Clifton Larson's actually firing counties instead of counties firing Clifton Larson. So they fired Dunn County. They're not going to work with Dunn anymore. Um, it's a really challenging time if you're an accountancy. Uh, and so they were able to get all our stuff done, but just barely. Um, I mean, literally, they got the report filed to the state on September 30th, and it's 11.59, September 30th is the deadline. And we were literally worried that they wouldn't get it done. So some of this is just, you know, what's the old statement? It's the economy <laughs> stupid kind of thing. Uh, right. Exactly. So. so we're trying to adjust with that. Yeah. So far, we haven't gotten a year fired notice. I was CLA, say, what can we do to not get fired? Yeah, we've confirmed that they intend to keep us. Wow. Keep it close and transparent. Make it easy. Make it easy. We have uh, a great staff. We've got a great time. Any questions? Anybody else? Thank you, Don. <clears throat> okay.
we're ready to go back up. Okay, so now we're going to go back up to number eight, update on uh, seven, homelessness, unhoused, presentation, discussion panel. Okay, so if our panel wants to come on up. Well, some chairs. Yeah. Your yeah. I'm assuming you're. I think I'll edit Erica, Jimmy, and Lynn, right? Yes, and Diane. Okay, I think I can get people. Oh, yeah. okay. All right, so these are the experts that we brought back. Um, so last month we talked about the Key Mental Act and how it related to the schools. It is a school um, act for homelessness. Um, the top themes that came out of the um, two that showed at this meeting where the, the drivers for the homelessness were affordable housing, mental health, and substance, substance use issues, remember? Um, so we thought we would bring it back and have this panel of people, and I'll introduce them in a second, um, talk about what they see are the, the main issues with regard to homelessness or being unhoused, um, and then talk about the resources that they have. They're all connected to resources, so they'll be able to tell us um, if there's barriers to getting resources or you know just what they're seeing in the community um, specific to Fort Collins. So we have Tim Mather. Yep. He is from West Cap. Um, you're a uh, associate director. Associate director. And Erica, yeah. you are from West Cap. West Cap as well. So you specialize in in the homeless yes. intervention program. Okay. And Jenny Ormsby mm -hmm. from Northwood Homeless. Lynn Engelbertson is from Engelbert. 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 There is our Engelbert. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, and she works with Salvation Army. And Diana Peterson is our economics. So um, I don't know who wants to start out. Um, we'll talk about those top um, issues that you guys are seeing that are causing homelessness, unhoused issues. Um, so if this is your I'll start. You're staying. For full transparency, I'm the associate director. I have been in that role for a year. I know uh, enough. I don't want to say this. I know more about home weatherization and energy assistance than I do about homeless intervention. So, call myself an expert is probably a stretch. Erica, on the other hand, uh, is well versed in the, in the realm of homelessness, and I am primarily here to support her in her role. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, so I guess I can kind of jump in. Um, I know I kind of did crunch some of our numbers because we don't get a lot of calls, um, people from Polk County specifically asking for assistance. So I wanted to look back at our numbers. Um, so I went back to our last grant year, which would be July 1st of 2021 through June 30th, 2022. There was a total of 29 inquiries people that had either gone on our website and put in a request saying they needed assistance or called. And then when our, we have a intake and assessment specialist that returns all those calls. Um, they, when she called back to do the assessment, they were no longer in Fort Collins. Most of them had left um, to Grace Place Shelter, typically, because um, they didn't have anywhere else to be. So then it gets, so it's kind of hard to tell numbers because when, then they get recorded in St. Croix County versus the whole county. So there could be more that originated in the whole county, but when they move to a different county to a shelter, it gets recorded in that county then. So um, to say that there wasn't anybody or there isn't anybody is not true. But when we're going back and looking at numbers and where the calls are originating from and where they are when we call them back, they're typically not um, still in Polk County or they don't qualify for West Cap assistance based on the guidelines that HUD has provided to us for our homeless intervention program. Um, when we did the point time count in July, there wasn't any uh, people found on the streets in Polk County during that, because every January and July, we're required to do a point time count the fourth Wednesday of the month. Um, but that's not uncommon in our rural counties. We see that in a lot of our other counties as well, because um, either they don't want to be found, they have, you know, they're back in the woods somewhere, very hidden, 
they don't want us to locate them because usually they think that we're law enforcement and we're going to you know, kick them out and stuff. So they're well hidden or they're what people consider like house shopping. So they're staying on friends and family, which we wouldn't know that from that. Um, so kind of going back to what you guys talked about, what we see as well for our the clients that we're getting is it's a lot of alcohol and drug abuse, mental health, same stuff that you guys were talking about. And then the biggest issue we've seen recently is the market for housing. There's just no affordable housing and we're seeing it like so West Cap covers a total of seven counties and we're seeing it across the board in every single county. So it's not just here um, that it's happening, but we're seeing a lot of that where we just can't, even with assistance, we're worried that once they come off of our systems, how are they going to make this work because the cost of rent is just so much. Kind of that one jump in and add to that. Sure. Um, Northwoods Homeless Shelters is primarily um, family shelter. Um, and so we're seeing all those things. Um, certainly, once we start helping people, the lack of transportation in a rural area is absolutely huge. You know, I, I'm getting back to it. Before COVID, I would transport to work, from work, you know, to County appointments, to medical appointments. Um, the resources are difficult to um, provide for homeless families and individuals. Um, one of the most critical things that has happened in the past few years is um, the shutting down of surrendering homes here in Boston Lane because that was where the single people were held. When somebody came out of the jail, they could go right across the street, get sheltered, get services, get closed. If somebody was jailed in the summer and they were exited in the winter and they had flip-flops and shorts, they could go to Serenity Home. Now they're walking. And I had somebody that we housed that said they were exited from jail and their nearest resource, they walked nine hours to get to where they need to go because they had no transportation. And by that time, a lot of people, I mean, by the time we see them, they kind of burn their bridges as far as family and friends. So when they need something like transportation, it's like, no way, man, you know, they're, we're not gonna help you. So they walk nine miles or nine hours. Um, so we're seeing that, we are seeing AODA issues, we're seeing mental health issues. Um, but I would say the closing of Serenity Home was huge because my waiting list right now for singles is double digits. Um, it's a bad time of year because it's getting cold, but literally there are no services, hardly any services as far as shelter for singles in the county. Um, I will not leave a unit empty. So if there are no families on the waiting list, there will be a single in that shelter unit. But I refer to Grace Place. So, you know, the singles, a lot of them do go from Polk County to Grace Place, to uh, St. Clair County, until, you know, if they want to come back, if they're working, if they're housing, if they find housing here. But housing also is a huge issue. Um, most of who I work with are single parents, mostly single moms, but sometimes single dads. Um, not much in the way of child support, little or none. And when you've got a single parent with a minimum wage job with kids, and you're looking at a two or three bedroom place, and, and the rent is like $1,200 plus, you know, it's they can't do it. You know, they literally can't do it. And you can find sometimes housing that's a lot less than that or affordable, but then in the wintertime, you can throw a tap through the crack in the place. I mean, so they're paying for utilities. They're coming to the town for emergency utility assistance. Um, the housing is just a horrible issue right now. And I've been doing this since my 20th year. So this is the worst I've ever seen housing. 
Um, we only have one family housing authority in the county, and that's in Emory. Um, and they've got a waiting list for a couple of years. I mean, you know, and so our emergency shelters are based off of a 90 day plan <laughs> yeah. to get somebody on their feet into housing, you know, and it's an almost impossible thing right now to do that. That's kind of where we're sitting. And I think West Cut, Tim, you guys can speak more to even the impending homeless population. Because you you guys had the We Rock funding the last couple of years, and you guys paid out a lot of money to keep people in their existing environment, correct? Under We Rock? Yeah. 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 Wisconsin Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Yeah. We talked a little bit about it last time. Right. We talked a little bit about it last time. Yes. Yeah. And uh, folks that are eligible for energy assistance enrolled in energy assistance will not be qualified for rental assistance, which will pay 18 months of their rent, uh, be proactively or retroactively. And it's been a very robust program, very popular. I believe overwhelming for our agencies to some degree. Very taxing on us. And it's just a sheer volume of, of need out there, and it's very real. Uh, and um, it, you know, it's a good program. Um, I I can anecdotally say that you know part of the need is just purely based on the cost of renting a home, renting a house, or renting an apartment, and that cost has has increased over the years, um, especially during COVID. So uh, it's it's a you know at first blush it might appear like it's an employment issue or a lack of employment issue for the need for rent assistance, but it is also uh, Product byproduct of high values uh, for them. So it's a combination of things that are driving this demand. And if I can speak real quickly, uh, uh, didn't you mention the people that are coming out of incarceration aren't really equipped to be on the street? I just wanted to point out that uh, Dunn County um, will for a CDBG grant. And has funded a program that we're operating, has been operating for about two years now, Eric. Two and a half. It's our Dunn County Transitional Housing Program. So, folks that are coming out of incarceration have this buffer to transition through, um, and it's been working very well. Mm -hmm. If you want to just yep. touch on that. Yep. So, we um, have so we have a total of, so just kind of backtrack. So, as you know, like the city of Menominee, because of the College there, there's a lot of like college ship housing. So there's been landlords who've been willing to rent us entire homes. So we have a total of four houses right now um, two six bedrooms, one five bedroom, and one nine bedroom. Um, and we have a men and one women separated. So they're not cohabitating together just to kind of keep that those issues <laughs> separate. Um, but the need has been, I mean, we have a waiting for that program too but it's been great as far as they come out they don't pay rent there they don't pay utilities they're allowed to i mean they do have rules and stuff that they have to follow they have to be following their program doing their PO appointments following the rules or whatever treatment program they have um but it's been really good to have them, the case managers work with them on what is it that you need do you need a birth certificate do you need a driver's license do you need how can we help them get a job how do we, you know, really getting them to that point where they can start earning some income and then they can put it away and, and we've seen some of them make enough to um, rent their own unit, actually move out on their own um, and have been so doing so now um, without assistance for a little while. So, and then we also work with the, the Grand County Housing Authority as well to help provide subsidy if it's something where they have income but it's not enough to cover rent um so we do kind of reach out to other programs as well to help them but it's been a great uh program for them transitioning and the sole purpose was for people coming out of either uh jail or treatment that obviously kind of their backgrounds aren't so great um you know they're still in recovery they're early in recovery um so it has challenges too because of course you have a lot of people in recovery together <laughs> so sometimes that can pose problems but it also We've also seen them be able to kind of support each other as well. So it creates kind of that environment of like they're not out there doing it themselves as well. But we've seen success with that. 
that was specifically done county rule for that and then came to West Cap and said, hey, we got this grant. Can you can you um you know get the ball rolling? And so then we, we did the rest. So can you unpack the acronym of what kind of grant that was? DG or yeah, it's you you know, know, no, I'm grant. Oh, of course. Yeah. Federal. I believe it's uh, I think it's targeted to municipalities that are 70,000 and more. So uh, we have been investigating what rural counties might do. Uh, but that is, that's what we wonder if they they do they bundle up with someone. That's that's what we wonder. Yeah. It's so, it's a municipality or, or government. Yeah. Only like the grants, as far as I understand. <clears throat> Is this something that you can roll out in Full County somehow? Bundle with Bernadette? We'll, we'll research that. Okay. Okay. That's always a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. We would love to replicate it. It's very successful. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. It makes a connection uh, from a person walking out with no resources and a bad background, and you know, us being able to help them. Um, you know, find temporary shelter, get their get their ducks in a row, and uh, and provide a reference. You know, West Cap can we can rent an apartment that a, a client might not be able. To. So we try to make a connection, and it's been very successful. Can I ask the amount of that grant? Uh, no, I don't have the amount. Two million. I would say two million. Just. Off the record here, uh, about two years to support that program. I think we spent about 30 or 40, 30 or 40,000 a month, 35,000 a month. The case management, four buildings, um, and utilities. 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 How many beds total? So total 0 to 26 bedrooms total. Um, and then so we have 23 of those 26 still currently. And um, several on the waiting list that are still currently in jail that may have given us a heads up or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the services there would be the Serenity House gap, yeah. right? That's kind of, I mean, it's kind of what Serenity House did, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it was roughly yeah. a homeless shelter. So maybe Lenny, you want to talk about it? Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> Serenity Home uh, Shelter that's in Barron. Is not open yet. I'm not exactly sure when that's going to open. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we had, I think, we had some architectural, architect stuff or architect that came out and said we had to change some things, so it kind of backed us up a little bit. But um, I used to run the Serenity Home up here, and I, I've seen so much change. I mean, especially since COVID, um, so much more mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, and AODA issues, um, and I mean, I, I'm actually on the road. I drive up here, and I do case management, and I also go to Radisson, Wisconsin, and ladies live. I'm kind of all over, and <clears throat> Ginny's right. Everybody actually mentioned that housing is so, it's just so ridiculous, the rents and everything. I mean, I can barely, I'm renting a house in Dunn County. I can barely get bored and working. So I can imagine what it's like for uh, you know my clients, and um, they want to be you know they want to have a job and they want to get on their feet, and and so you know as a case manager that's part of my job as to what can I help you with, and I'll sit there and actually make phone calls with them right there, you know, and we you know, like so I do mainly social security for people as my clients, but I also have been doing that for a long time. Um, and uh, I help them if they can't work, if they're disabled, I help them get on Social Security. Um, and of course, now that backs up to that's about an eight or nine month wait for approval. And, and I can understand, you know, clients are like, gosh, you know, when is this going to happen? When am I going to get approved or whatever? They're eight to nine months backed up behind. So, no, is that, is that like 162? Social Security or disability? Disability. disability. Mm -hmm. SSI and SSI. Oh, okay. yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then those that are able to work, um, give them resources. Um, and if they need transportation, we figure something out, which, but it's still hard. Um, and 
being like in Ladysmith and my clients in Radisson, the client in Radisson just got a, was able to get enough money together for a car. So to transport, because she's got a daughter that she shares custody with. But there's just so much out there. Just, it's just sad. And people not having a place to go and not a place to live. Uh, at Grace Place, we, um, we serve 478 people. And I would say, Dwan and I were talking about it, and our case managers as well, and about 75% of people are from home. You know, but they're spread out because sometimes with, with the renting and everything, they've had to go to Ladysmith or um, Radisson. And it, uh, it's a long drive for me. I don't, I don't mind it, you know. Um, I just feel bad for them because they can't be where they work or where they're 75% of the yeah. Polk County? Of the 478? Yeah. That's true. When we, when we have tried to house um, clients up here in the past in Polk County, and the big issue is transportation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even if we find a place for them, they don't, they don't have a vehicle. You know, they don't have, so, and we can't, at West Cap can't provide either the full person for transportation, unfortunately. So then... Like, well, we, can't, we don't want to put you somewhere. Yeah, your house, but now you can't get to the grocery store. You can't get, you know, to your doctor's appointments and all these things. And then if they have children on top of it, it it's like, well, it's not feasible to put you there. So, you know, we get more success in cities where there's public transportation or some kind of, like, you know, for example, like the book has a shared ride where we can purchase vouchers for clients, um, that kind of stuff. Now, Menominee has a bus system. Um, I think, you know, up in New Richmond, we can get taxi vouchers and things like that. So it's finding, being able to help them get those vouchers as well. So once they start working, then they can kind of pay for some of that on their own. But until that point, they have to bridge that gap. They can't work. You know, and then they're like, well, I can't just. That's true. So we, um, we have a uh, county did the transportation study. It's ongoing. Okay. Meeting on Wednesday at noon, just to regroup after Tim departure. I don't, have uh, that. I don't know if it was just the county. Just the county people. Um, but we are meeting with the regional planners to see where they're at with that. Okay. So it's still ongoing. Right. So yeah. my wheels turning. I would like to just personally, I think it's it's easier to focus on. on um, the lack of affordable housing rather than throwing in. I mean, you know, you gotta look at the root causes, lack of transportation, mental health and social disease, but um, really the lack of affordable housing, and that's why we're here today, I mean, ultimately. So transportation, I wanna feel like it's coming, right? The transportation. We have this active study going on. Yeah, and realistically speaking, it's going to be a long time before it gets wheels on the ground. Right. Um, no pun. No pun intended. Right. <laughs> pun completely intended. Um, so, you know, but the wheels turn slowly, but I think they'll the present their findings to us and recommendations in January? the first quarter. Yeah, January, I think. It will be, and then and then it will need to be, you know, implemented and all of that. So inside right now, I'm feeling that that's all good and fine, but we have nothing for housing. No, you know, I want to go on record and just say that um, we had um, a proposal for 1.5 million dollars for to try and try and do a trickle down and move some elderly people out of their big homes into smaller so that we can fill, you know, and it was shot down by, by the board. I, I, I don't understand why yet, um, but with information like this, um, to me, if, if it was missing in that proposal and it was missing in the nine people that, that shot it down, I think that they probably wouldn't have. You know, you hear what I'm saying? This is like really good information. Now it's gonna be hard for me 
to to go to my constituents and give them give them stuff when it's my scribbling going on. You know, I there. I mean, I work for 3M. I work for Eastman Kodak. One of the most successful things is we we locked a bunch of smart people in a room and say, figure it out, be creative, let's come up with a plan, and we'll feed you and we'll do whatever it takes. We'll clear all obstacles. You guys are the smartest people on this subject in the room. Tell us what we need to do. Give us that power. You know, um, as far as affordable housing, one thing that we really need more of the 30% low income family housing, but a huge gap in single people. Huge gap. Even a one bedroom apartment is a huge amount of money. And a lot of these single people that we're seeing are actually parents that should be paying child support. Mm -hmm. And you start taking child support out of a minimum income, and then what are they going to do for housing? Mm -hmm. And so they're couch surfing until somebody gets tired of them, and then they're trying to find something else. And then, so the single people, the gaps for single people are just horrible, mm -hmm. also. And I think that's what we see in for economic support, too. And so, like, a lot of focus is getting the elderly moved out of their, their existing homes into a portable other housing, but realistically, our calls that we get aren't about the house, the elderly being unhoused. It's about the single people, the two parent households that are living separately, two children from one home to another. That's the population that we aren't serving. And so I know that you don't want to focus on transportation because there's this transportation study out there. But what we see is a ripple effect. So if you don't have a for somebody in housing, you're not going to have them have transportation. If they don't have housing and transportation, then they're not going to be able to have a employment. Um, and if they in between there, then there's also child care. Affordable child care. It's insane how much it costs to have a child in child care. We here in Polk County have very little licensed and certified providers in this county. A lot of our daycare is being provided by unregulated care providers where they, and those individuals can't have public assistance because they're using unregulated care. Quite frankly, we're relying on our school districts right now to provide daycare. Luckily, most of our, our schools in, our, in this county have built daycare centers that have that for us, but we still are lacking huge resources that all impact housing, transportation, employment. So I know that we like to keep it boxed, but it really, it can't. It all has to be folded, to, like melded together. Um, so again, same thing with you guys. Substance abuse is huge. People are moving around. Um, we also have our registered sex offenders and our drug felons. Even with low-income housing, they have restrictions because of that. So again, that population is not being served because of restrictions that the low-income housing population has for rules and regulations. So um, I would like to see our focus be more on the single population, these families, um, and finding them affordable housing and what that looks like instead of focusing on um, moving elderly out. Because even if you move elderly into their own type of housing, it still has to be affordable what's sitting out there for them in that population. Um, two things. One, I'm completely with you. I'm hoping that as Time moves forward here as everybody's realizing all the different ways that housing is affecting and you know, house population or workforce population or senior population, things like that. Um, that we don't necessarily look at it as a either or that these are all things that need to be addressed. Um, because they all impact everything in different ways. Um, I just want to clarify for me when you guys are saying, because you both brought it up now. Um, you'd started off saying that there's a need for the 30% low income family housing like that. We know that exists. And then you guys kind of went on to go further about how we need to address the single, single parents or I don't know what you're talking about. 
but, single individuals. Yeah, are living but by have, themselves. So right. is that is there an issue there of um, they don't necessarily qualify for those other housing options? It's family or it's elderly disabled, and if you're not either one of those, you don't get the, the low income. Thirty percent income housing. So you're, and you're talking strictly single. Mm -hmm. So if they had children, they do qualify then? If they, yeah, if they've got children living with them. But the family units, the minimum family units that we've got are full. Yep. And there's a few years. Yeah, yeah and, and I'm not necessarily talking about like availability or anything like that. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out the need. Children. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And so like one of the biggest areas of need that you're seeing are those, the most impactful areas would be those single, there's a huge gap in Polk County. This yeah. service is just And as businesses, I get as it. cities try to bring businesses into their, their industrial parks and things like that, that's a that's great that they want to bring that into this county, but we don't have the support system to back up that individuals being housed here to be able to work in those industries. So we have to figure out how to have housing for our single adults or our working population still so that these businesses can have employee employees. Right. It, we just don't have that. Right. Maybe the maybe the businesses need to be involved in this too. So well, that we some. have the Cimarron's and the Tartan Parks and you know Rochester, New York. I mean well the, the housing in those communities were built by three I mean that's I said this before. That was a, those don't have to be days gone by, really. And maybe that's where we need to go. Maybe the bigger ones. That's going to help help us. But I get it. You know, we have to get health care to. We have to do prenatal care. Who's going to argue with that? Right. We have to get housing. Who's going to argue with that? How? What? What do we do? How? I say. Uh, Zoning is a cultural thing. Uh, my, my perspective in the city of Minneapolis is eliminated the residential one. No, like there's no single family zone in the city of Minneapolis out there addressing their housing shortage. So, for a single family home, it's a rent case for now. You have to be under the radar. And so, it's it maybe creative ways to. It is going to be creative. So, you have to. Look at our structure the way it is right now, and be critical of it. I would say, you know, what are they selling our, our, uh, our counties and our yeah. municipalities? Yeah. It's one of those things that we have to look at. Yeah, in St. Craig Falls, they changed the zoning to allow tiny homes. Mm -hmm. So there's a tiny home development that is already booked up with a waiting list and it's already ready to expand. And that is a single. I was going to speak to that because in Chippewa County too, they started because they lost uh, their shelter as well as the fund. They lost funding and then it closed, and they started through a local pastor who realized the need, and he got a lot of community backing for that, and started the first tiny homes that they built there were built by volunteers just wanted to do it, um, and so and then the church, local churches in the area put up a few of these tiny homes outside their church and let them use like. Facilities inside because there's no showers and no tiny things, and hot plates, that kind of stuff in there. Um, and what they have done now is they were able to, they just now wrote for a grant, they did the CDBG grant that uh, the John County did, and they got that grant. So they were able to actually purchase a building in Chippewa that used to be an old, like, um, oral surgery building that was just sitting vacant. And so they bought that, they converted the building and put like showers in there and a kitchen and they put the slabs, they built slabs of um, cement, put the tiny homes now there. Um, and the goal is that they're going to build additional two and three bedroom units behind the tiny homes. So that will be low income housing for families as well. And they've actually gotten a lot of support. They just did a... Um, Presentation to the community actually last month, was it? Maybe end of September. Um, and they got a ton of what, community support kind of donations for that um, as well. So they're, they got just a lot of community backing and a lot of people volunteering to just do it because they just realized there's a need for um, 
for the community. So that's kind of been kind of interesting and fun to watch because it's that's awesome. Yeah. And they're they're actually what they're gonna do with it, it should be self-sustaining eventually because they're doing like a they're making like a rec center for kids because there's gonna be the kids there that they're going to have the playground area and build in the garden area where they can actually grow their own, you know, fruits and you know, veggies and stuff like that. So that's the the big picture for where they're at right now is we have the, the building with the showers done and the tiny and that's in Chippewa. Yep. Is that in the city or the county? Is it in the city of Chippewa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's open to anybody, you know, in the county. It's not oh you know, field trip. Yeah. Oh, so you have to check it out for a video or a, yeah. even a presentation from the people that are yeah. I can reach out to them. Um who uh yeah. Mike Kahuna is uh, the yeah. pastor yeah. that I can reach out to him and just pass along and uh, like I'm taking the big support. Because he they, yeah. they they when they did their presentation, they actually gave us like <laughs> diagrams and showed us. Really, it's very yeah, that would be great to see. Yeah. So in your yeah. guys is what you hear on the street about housing, the lack of housing, and the need. What do you think people want? Do they want to live in an apartment, a duplex, a fourplex? Like what specifically on the ground kind of units are should we be shooting for? Do you have any feel? Maybe that's just too technical at this point, but I'm just curious. Well, I, mean, I would just go and. I would go with like apartments at this point just to get them more. Um, I mean, there are, we do see clients that say, well, I would like a house out in the country. And I'm like, well, you know, like, you know, like I get it and I, and I understand where they're coming from, but the likelihood of that, of finding something like that that's affordable for them is not realistic. But, um, you know, I would say apartments more. Just so I can wrap my head around it, uh, we talked about for those that single population of need, they don't qualify for the 30% low income because of them not being family or elderly. Do they have any other, are there any other types of housing that they can qualify for? Or is that just one of the, you said there's a gap. Is there just a, a complete gap there for availability for anything outside of market housing? Yes, what I'm seeing is when we have singles and we're looking for housing, mm -hmm. yeah. That's it, when you, it's not surprising because when you look at that 2020 study, the age of existing rental uh, rental housing is old and occupied. So, I mean, it's it's not it's not surprising that that's not there. I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't like another thing that they qualified for. Well, and some of that too with the tables is their criminal history. Um, you know, they have mass charges and stuff. That's, yeah. That, and I can understand from a landlord perspective too of like. There's a risk of them, you know, damaging the unit or that kind of stuff. Because, like for example, West Cap, we own or have built some affordable housing units, um, and they're people can apply for them no matter what they're, yep. you know, they don't have to be family only. But what kind of will exclude some of that is their history. Yeah, and and I certainly don't doubt that. But years ago, like when my wife moved here, you know, there's also just the fact that. She was a single person that moved here and couldn't find a suitable place to rent because it didn't exist. Um, so, yeah, it's it, I don't doubt that there's issues with like history and things like that, but it's also you can take that history away and you've got a different population of people who are either young people just moving to the area or uh, you know, having just graduated high school, college, or anything like that. And then that inventory of housing at that level is almost non-existent. Matthewson is counting is off the chart. I would say probably at least 75% of the people that are housed in the history of men. It's not on the drug, but there's so much men and they are of course attempting to they're wanting to get back on their feet. But it's it's been there. And we've also had the access People for Matthews and I. And the reality is that it takes two years for their head to be there. I'm trying to get back to the baseline. The timeline is getting them so early. When Jenny and were talking about, mentioned earlier about the Serenity, when, when that was open, it was <clears throat> very helpful for singles. We, we didn't. Unless there was an emergency type uh, situation, you know, when we would use like a TV room or something and have 
and then temporarily. Um, and she, they would share like a, you know, the shower facilities and the bath um, in another area. But um, at least people, the single people had a place to go and they had uh, transportation so that we could bring them to and from work and two doctor's appointments and you know, dental appointments or whatever. And um, now that just, it's gone and it, it just makes them uh, yeah. Over. Yeah. Can I ask why did it went away? Pardon me? Why did it go away? Um, people on the board didn't want to hear any more. Did the oh, renew the lease? On this yeah. board? Or is this part? Pardon? Previous. Tell me, board. It sounds like we're talking about super high level. We're talking about two different kinds of populations, one being one of kind of immediate need of. You know, whether they're coming out of corrections or substance abuse, things like that, that have, you know, literally like you're talking about, come out and they're in flip flops in the middle of winter. Like that's what I believe. That happened yeah. actually a lot. No, I, yeah. No, yeah. no, and I, I believe that. And I'm talking about like that seems like one separate type of need that needs to be addressed. And then we've got this other type that needs to be addressed of a more stable situation, which is black box. Right. So that's where you know we're talking about a lot of different things here. As far as like, I hope we don't group all of this together because again, we're every time we meet about something like this, we're peeling back another layer of an onion that shows another specific area. Of it. So not it trying to be, to be alarmist or anything, but I hope right. that we keep recognizing that there are many niche areas that need some attention. So, and it's not the matter of one solution or one proposal solving each one. It's just people in uh, organizations like this recognizing the issues that exist and then seeing when and where and how we can assist. I just wanted to, to, to put a bow on that. It, it seems like to me, my observation is we feel we're tripping over our own feet sometimes because we look at things as if we should solve the world's problems in one shot and we're letting perfect be the or yeah perfect be the enemy of good and i understand one to be effective in what we do but i think the because if we go at the same rate that we have now we're going to have meetings like this multiple times every year for years on end so as we identify these areas, whether it be that population that is coming out and needs immediate help because of corrections or substance abuse, or the single person who can't find housing because it doesn't exist, so on and so forth, I think this is where I'm happy that we're talking about this stuff, but now we need to start figuring out what are the ways that we can start to chip away at this, not take a big home run swing that's going to solve everything and it's done, but start putting one foot in front of the other and address it. Knowledge is power. I mean, we're not going to do anything unless everybody understands what the heck is going on. I'm through that point. <laughs> Gary, would you be willing to say a couple words? So, so to, to give a little background, the, the piece that, that uh, was referred to earlier that we killed at the county board was a proposal from the uh, EBC to look at senior housing, that whole domino thing. And so that got killed. So then, but we had also in this committee been talking about housing. And so we kind of started merging things. And I don't know, Gary, you want to say a little bit or pull up a chair on I, where things well, are at? But yeah. What, well, we're talking I, about essentially, you know, the non workforce housing things. So now I don't know. Right. I, I, I apologize for being late. I was incorrectly told it was 10. We used and, to be 10. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Just, the, the website needs to come through. But anyhow. <laughs> oh my. But anyhow, um, so I apologize for being late. Um, Amy and a few other supervisors did reach out to me. Oh, for those of you who don't know me, Terry Hauer, I'm the executive director of Polk County Economic Development Corporation. Not a county employee. We're an independent organization that works with the county to promote economic development. And of course, housing is huge. Right now, the needs are workforce, housing. Talk to any employer uh, in that order. And there's other things like childcare and some other areas that spin off of that. 
So we did propose an initiative that made its resolution <laughs> status for the county to consider, and it didn't make it to actual vote. But I know there is something else in the works right now. I haven't seen what the final uh, looks like uh, or what it's really going to entail. But there is another resolution that the county would step up and be able to somehow provide some incentive for housing. Um, the goal of any initiative, I think, countywide or not, as far as employment-based housing goes, is how to differentiate ourselves from other counties surrounding us. Because we have the same problem that St. Croix County does, that Pierce does, when it comes to housing. How can we differentiate ourselves to say, hey, let's do this development in Polk County because they have this incentive program or they're willing to give us these tax benefits or whatever can be come up with uh, would be my I'm sorry I missed the whole discussion. Maybe that was already brought up, but trying to distinguish ourselves as the county of choice is, is really uh, something that we strive for in the EDC. Uh, something that we're constantly trying to do is differentiate ourselves as Polk County being the place you want to live, work, and play. So anything that we can do from a housing perspective to make that easier to do, um, yes, it does cost money, but there's tax advantages on the back end of that. So the front end, yes, requires money. Back in, you get tax revenue from it long term. A couple of these, including the resolution we had, also had a revolving loan concept to it. So it actually pays the county back over time. That's something that can be worked in as well. So, Amy, I don't know if that's kind of what, I mean, that's kind of where I'm up to yeah. speed on things. Yeah. I don't know when this new resolution will be available uh, or, or brought before general government. I, I don't know. Do that you know what committee that is that coming out of Gen Gov? I think it's going to be presented <laughs> at Gen Gov initially. Are you helping write, write it? I've seen the first draft of it okay. and given some input, input on it, but I am not directly who's, behind this one. Who's working on this one? So uh, council may want to provide some backstopping here, but I believe that uh, there's a resolution being drafted by Brad Olson that will show up on uh, the 14th at general government. And, and that is true. I'm working on it with uh, Supervisor Olson from what I can glean, he sent me sort of his high level ideas. I'm trying to whittle down what is he really intending. The way I perceive it right now, it is a revolving loan fund, but with a two year sort of, let's try it out for two years. Um, and it would be 2% paid back loans given to municipalities to then incent housing, and that includes towns, cities, and villages, but then a request to have other entities manage it. I, again, I'm a little gray on some of the ifs and hows, and there isn't an amount yet in there. It's a blank line. So I think his intention, and I don't want to speak for him, but my, my assumption is he wants it to be a discussion that's had. So that number of how much, a million, two million, whatever, is decided as a group rather than presented by him as an individual supervisor. Sure. Mm -hmm. a great conversation to have with somebody who crafted a resolution gonna, prior to this. Yeah. It's not going to matter until they hear from these people. Because we're talking about this issue, it would be maybe beneficial for this committee to consider some amendments or add-ons or single workforce elderly to make it, like you said, one continuum of housing need. Um, so I think there's a lot of a lot of good things that can come out of all these heads together, including, I mean, everybody oh. here is for the same reason, right? Um, so just my you know, opinion that. So you're saying look at this resolution and, and make go sure at it collectively. Incorporate some of this stuff that we really know is happening on the ground. We still have the, the issue of affordable housing. What these guys are talking about, it's separate from what Terry is talking about, but I think it they all roll together. And that's just my thought that we really need to, to look at the big picture of housing. There's so many different tracks. Um, they've named three single housing, workforce housing, elderly housing. Um, I think that covers everything that everybody is in this room for. Well, and then also the special transition, the transitional, transitional housing, transitional, which is the sub importance mm -hmm. of the yeah. a whole other transition. Yeah. As we look at allocating resources and applying for grants and whatnot, I feel like 
there needs to be a collaboration um, so we get the most bang out of our, our dollars. It's lovely grants. Rita, did you have something to add? I just agree, well said. Um, the transitional also to be included, yes. <laughs> I have a question for you, Terry. But the but the piece that you guys are talking about is also covering workforce housing. It might not be covering transitional housing, but that's kind of what we're talking about, right? I mean, aren't we talking about under this new resolution? Well, no, your old vision, the old, the old, I guess, kind of the work that you guys do at EDC is not limited to just workforce housing. No. Yeah. No, to but to to the employers locally. Uh, that I try and do my best to represent and work with and provide uh, opportunities for growth for them. Um, I, I would say any housing is good housing if they can be part of the workforce. So I'm not opposed to any level of housing um, as the EDC director anyhow. I think it would be great and I think all our local employers would agree with that. Terry, you missed earlier, but I said, you know, I keep bringing up the... <laughs> The housing, like Target Park and Cimarron and all of that, could not have been done without the employers. Are the employers willing to partner in any of them? There are employers um, in Polk County right now that are actually um, becoming un. They're not excited about it, but they're building their own housing for their workforce. Yay! Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's how we need more of that. That's that's the situation right now. And there's and there's similar initiatives underway for childcare, where these employers do not want to be a child care providers, but they're looking into options to have a child care facility that somebody else could manage and they'll just have preferred, you know, for their employees. It'll be open to the public, but it'll be, you know, kind of so many seats reserved for them and that kind of thing. So from an employment standpoint, our employers are so that we can get both rich and house. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree. And that, that's a good start. Boy, I was going to walk out of here and just really, I mean, what a what a Debbie Downer kind of day. <laughs> right? Yeah. But that gives, yeah. me, that gives me a lot of hope. Yeah, well, and employers are, are yeah. getting to the point where they yeah. just, they, they really don't have good. options. Some of that profit. And I think when you look at the transitional population, the housing need there, there's a whole nother layer that has to come with that transitional housing. And that is the case management piece that Ginny and the Salvation Army and Westcap offer that. It's because it's that whole education piece of budgeting, mm -hmm. uh, prioritizing, how do you pay for a car? So as much as you want to look at that whole transitional housing piece, there is a whole nother layer that has to come with that population as well. And what that, because if you don't have that, you, they will not succeed. They need that extra hand holding and that level of education that could go with that. <coughs> treatment. Yes, along yeah, the yeah. Treatment. treatment. Yeah. Yes. So, so it is a, there's a whole partnership. So, like when Tanya talks about our strategic plan for 2023 to 2025, a big piece of that could encompass all of that into that partnering and how we, that looks for us as housing becomes available. Another, another question that I'm going to the, the Amory Housing Authority mm -hmm. seems like a model to me. Um, I, I, the townhouses are huge. So, you know, I said this before, the, the skyscraper. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't look like people are like, Accumulating junk and trash, the yard bills seem really nice. So, how many units does anybody know how many units they have? Well, in the, the high rise, which is where my office is, there's 33 units of elderly disabled. There's two other buildings of elderly disabled, um, I would say less than a mile from the high rise. And um, I'm not sure how many units they have there. Then the family units are over by the school. And they've got three buildings called Twin Pines, and then they've got a building called Pinewood. Um, Twin Pines, they don't pay utilities. Pinewood, um, they pay electric, but then I think that's factored into their rent. 
somehow the the electricity has to be limited. And, um, so that's what is there. Although, like I said, they're just got so many applications and nobody's moving. You know, so if you, you try to move, you can't find a place. So you stay where you're at. So maybe we should maybe we should also consider like other municipalities in the county setting up something like that, using that as a model. And whether you have to whether we have to use funds and build more. Could they handle so another you know, an apartment building that would it make sense to take this information back to county administrator Netherland and ask him what direction um, so we can make some proposals to the board on um, what direction we should be going? Does that make sense? It makes sense to me. And I don't know what the status of the task force that you noted here on our little scribbling note back and forth. Yet. Yeah, I think there's been some enthusiasm for starting a task force around housing. I just don't know the status of that, but we can get with that to get back. Okay. You're willing to be in on that conversation? Yeah. Okay. Because it seems like if we could do the lock everybody in a room thing, there needs to be some next step. Yeah, so, okay. The purpose of the last two meetings have been yeah. to identify needs, come up with some themes, so we can take this information back and figure out how to allocate resources. I don't care. Yes. Uh, I got a point with Tim Surrey, but I just I'm from the Polk County Housing Authority. Oh, yeah. I'd just like to say something before I go. Um, we pretty much, Gay and I, I think, and we've been progressive. Uh, we were very much backing, you know, the serenity that we had over here. But the problem is, I've heard the same thing in a room and some good people with some ideas. But we haven't gotten it out enough to to make anything happen. We had this serenity over here, and I visit them people, and there were people there that did a lot of volunteering. But then some people complained to the Boston Lake Village Board, and they complained to the County Board, and we had negative people on on you know the County Board that shut it down. It was a tragedy, wasn't it? We didn't fight that. Uh, and, and looking at looking at Polk County, and and we're just for some reason we've had a negative attitude in Polk County and through the board, just about forever, I guess. Uh, you know, like here was the tobacco situation, seventy-two counties, and. Uh, you know, these counties, some of them are going to make $50 million handed to them. One county did not participate, and that was Polk County. You mean and the opioid, opioid not, not opioid, tobacco? Opioid, 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 yeah, opioid, yeah. excuse me. And Crazy. so the challenge is here is uh, how do we get it to the villages? Uh, Osceola now, we've had that beautiful hospital over there that could have been converted. In. But you got a church across the street, and now this is the third. This Cogman group is, wants to come in and, and have a beautiful place for 225 people, which would solve a lot of what we're talking about. But uh, the challenge of of overcoming the negative in Polk County and in the villages, and I think even some of our school situations, school boards. Uh, so we've got to get it outside this room. I think Jay and I, we, uh, and, uh, we, we've listened to this for 20 years. And, and so our challenge is not, our conversation is all here on what we need. But the challenge is, where do we go from here? How do we get it out to the people, you know, the villages, cities? Uh, boy, that's our, I, at the last meeting, I said, you know, we've got this beautiful Polk County housing, you know, that we've got uh, seven, one, we've got seven villages. Where, and I said, uh, are we ever gonna build any more units? How can we? We could double that right now and it would help. And that I, I don't believe there'll be ever any more 
uh, anything done like that. I just want to say our challenge is outside here. We can sit here and we can talk all day about the same, same thing. But on deaf ears till we get out to the people on the boards and uh, communities and even, you know, maybe something, but maybe we got to be more active in oh, uh, some of these PTAs or homemakers. The women seem to get things done to me. <laughs> 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 I'm always saying that. That was off the record. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> it, anyway, I think that just had to be brought out. Thanks, John. It, it's where we go. That's our challenge. And I would agree. When you look at the big picture for this county, how what do what do people want this county to look like? And what type of growth do we want in this county? One of the things that always has alarmed me is that a quarter of our population in this county have live here but have to be on public benefits because of the environment that this county has created for them with housing, transportation. Um, low paid employment. Um, so how it, it's such a huge picture and what do people of this county want this county to look like and be known for? That to me isn't what I, as a taxpayer of this county, I want to see for this county. I want to see growth, um, how beautiful housing, affordable housing, people of all being able to work, play, live here. And I don't, but it takes, it's a bigger picture than just this group sitting here and it has to come from our county board. Do any of you people have an update on this new facility in, in Barron at the Salvation Army? Yeah, um, we had uh, an architect that came in and they had to do some more work. And so that is kind of pushing the opening back a little bit. And so I don't know exactly when the opening is. That's the best thing we got going. Salvation Army, they seem, they seem to care and know the, know the basics and get it done. Yeah, I mean, it's in Barron County. So no. that's Serenity House 2.0. Yeah, we had one right here and we couldn't make it work. And that's, well, uh, yeah, that's because you have people saying children don't need coats in the winter, right? You, you need to make it hard for them to. Say no, we don't need affordable housing. You have to make it so hard for them that people will call them out if they disagree with you. Like somebody saying kids don't need coats in the wintertime, right? Children don't need school. Okay. We need to make we need to make it hard. And knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. That's it. I'm done, Madam Chair. Oh, you're good. <laughs> I think let's come back to the next meeting. Uh, after we kind of lay out a thing with Ben, what are we going to do? And loop in EDC and then all of you guys to the extent that your staff is time allowed. Thank you so much for coming and for all your great work in the community. Yeah, Holy thank you. Smart. Talk about where you live every day yeah. and what you're willing to give of your own time and energy and compassion um, in the gap of how our community is not compassionate. Not hospitable, not kind, and I'm just so moved by what you're doing. And I will, I will do anything I can in my role here to support you and uh, on the West Step Board. I just I cannot imagine what you carry around in your heart every day. So thank you so much. And this group here, uh, this these organizations, they are somebody that I've worked with for 30 years, and um, if it wasn't for them. It would be very a very different world that we live in. So I appreciate the work that partner team agencies that we have. They're not a lot, but they are here and they do great work here in the county. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for inviting us for coming. And if you have, you know, reach out to any of the supervisors and put a bug in our ear if you think of something. Yeah. Keep needling all of us seriously, but maybe actually needle the supervisors that are in this room also. Um, 
there was nine people that voted against this last resolution. So I think I feel like we're going to clean that up and move it forward, but it's still <laughs> helpful for them to hear from people about the urgency of it. Yeah, a, a letter, something. It's just that, like, well, like the what? Uh, do, like, that kind of stuff. Because on that note, you brought it up to me. Do, we, is, do you guys have anything that you can provide us that would be um, information that we could use in our our amendments, our resolution developments, our, you know, you know, think about that and send it to Tanya if you do. Like how great the need is or what we do. Yeah, like all the stuff that you guys, yeah, 75% of the people in Polk County are mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. My waiting list is shut it up, blah, blah, blah. Just a little bit of summary maybe of what you guys spoke today. I know that's like four, but. If it gets us, it would be really helpful. We, we write, I mean, look, I took three pages. I know. Exactly. So it um, needs a lot more coming from you. I will not for a second. Okay. The, the ammunition to make it hard for them to say no. Yeah. 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 Well, don't pay any attention to it. See the stark contract between what the reality and what that account provides. Prescribed to a slight hug. Yeah. I participated in it last this last round. Mm -hmm. and we have to do it after I think midnight, midnight mm -hmm. four a.m. Yeah. And honestly, if unless the person was camped out in the middle of the road, I would. Right. Yeah. Uh, that seems so silly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have tons of woods and farms. I mean, well, it's much more urban focus. And it's it's it an is. issue that we brought up multiple times with our, our staff at Woodcap because it's like they they oftentimes will come at us and be like, "Well, you guys haven't found anybody," and I'm like, "Well." Because it's rural. Like, yes. if you're walking downtown Milwaukee, yeah, you're going to find. Right. <laughs> they, they have camp. They, they have a whole lot of people. Like, but when you're, when you, when most of our area is woodland and farm and swamp, and right you know, it's like, <clears throat> you're not going to find them. They're, they're, they're indoors, probably sleeping on people. And it's a very hidden problem in rural areas because homelessness is not visible. So it's easy not to see it. Right? Yeah, we're, we're expected to approach them and ask them questions, and we're just not equipped to do that if we do find anyone. But I would say that, you know, from my perspective, the county is to some degree more equipped. When you when you observe people that are homeless, to, to approach them, to ask them questions, you know, we have sheriff's deputies, we have police department. Uh, they're trained and equipped to, to, to be able to gather some information that our, our staff aren't to do or trying to do. Um, and I don't want to put them in that position if they're fine. So right. mm -hmm. I guess that would be uh, good information for you to be able to gather from people that are in your town. Um, the other thing I just want to mention real quickly, I don't want to feel this on your back feet or this layer will make my eyes water. Uh, <laughs> it is our homeless intervention program is highly prescribed by HUD. Um, you know, we're told what we can do and how we can do it. One of the things that gives me a little bit of heartburn is uh, our permanent supportive housing program. And Erica can attest to this. You know, there's it's called permanent uh, for kind of a reason, and that is that our clients aren't obligated to leave the program. That's right. There's not a time limit. Like, no time so, limit. so, like, when we have a rapid rehousing program, which is a maximum of two years that they can have on that program. The permanent supportive housing program, the idea behind it is great. Like what, what HUD's idea was, was that these are the clients that have long-term substance abuse, severe mental health, that have been homeless, chronically homeless, mm -hmm. and they just need more time than two years to get back on their feet. That's the goal of it. And they want people to come off the program, but then, you know, clients get very comfortable <laughs> Well, on the program, they get comfortable with the case management, they get comfortable with West, you know, off the case managers coming in, and you know, they're so then they're like, But I don't want to leave because this is great, <laughs> you know, there's nowhere to go, there's so right. And then, plus, well, what we're seeing now is that there isn't like for them to, for us to move them off the program where we put them because they'll come back, they'll they won't be able to pay their rent, then they'll end up homeless again, and now they're back on our list, you know. and, and Part of what, what HUD looks at for our programming too is our recidivism. So they mm -hmm. run reports and they want to know how many people did you leave left your program that are now back. And we get kind of graded, so to speak, on those those different points. So um, it's important that when we, we exit them off program that we're comfortable that they can be successful. And they have, of course we don't want anybody to come back. Not homeless again. So. 
I think a lot of people don't even in this area don't deem themselves as homeless because they're living, they're continually living with uh, family, mm -hmm. um, friends, <clears throat> and things like that. So we probably have a higher mm -hmm. homeless population than what is really in numbers because for for rural areas, it is the it's become the norm to live with people. And but in homeless terms, they're probably actually defined as homeless. Mm -hmm. Right. But they <laughs> in technically a lot technically, of them. Technically, yeah, like yeah. HUD does not consider if you're color shopping, they don't consider that homeless um, to them. So if somebody calls into our program and asks to be put on our waiting list, they can't unless they are HUD's definition of litter, which is on the street, you know, in a car, in a tent, abandoned building, a shelter, um, or a hotel or motel paid for by a charitable organization. So if somebody calls us and says they're color shopping, that's interesting because we had the school district, the two yeah. school districts last month, mm -hmm. and they consider couch shopping homeless. Yeah. Well, I, honestly, homeless. in, in, in my opinion, it is homeless. Yeah. I, I agree yeah. with that 100%. I'm just HUD, saying that HUD 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 is really low, and it's underfunded, and it's undercounted, and it's a crime. It's, I hard. mean, it, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it is hard because it's hard on, on my staff, too, because we hear it all the time, and our hands are tied in the aspect of I can't. I can't override what HUD has given us right. or they'll pull us on anybody. Right. So it's it's a hard situation because we get a lot of people who are like, but I am homeless. And I'm like, I disagree with you. Well, and HUD doesn't define that person coming out of the corporation mm -hmm. because they have a business there. You know they're homeless. Yeah, not even if they're, not even if they have to be a registered sex offender. There's no address. Well, now I'm bumping out again, man. Okay. I know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks yeah. for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Terry, for coming. Are you ready for number 10? Is that done? Or is it? Uh, so, number 10 is end of year financial report. I think that was covered. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. Sorry. All right. We're going to have an overview of the website. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, I don't know if you're going to do like the main. I had Kathy to do our CFC. Yeah. Oh, okay. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I, you just want me to give kind of a brief overview of. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I'm going to try and top up. I'm, I'm over here in the corner so that I got the mouse and keyboard here to navigate a little bit. But uh, if you need me to speak up on the Zoom so the Zoom folks can hear me, just let me know. Um, but my name is Claire Johnson. I'm our public information uh, specialist here at Polk County. I was hired in the spring. And one of the four primary duties that I was given uh, with this position was actually spearheading this website initiative. Um, and so all of the uh, movement forward and getting us to this point in October where we've been able to launch it has been an incredible undertaking by uh, not only my office, but all of the staff that we here have here, you, know, you and Caleb over in CSD have really uh, played a huge role in this. Um, and just kind of as a brief overview of the main initiatives that I was given as far as this website uh, from Vince, uh, he really wanted a new site that not only was easier for our county folks to utilize in their own day-to-day -day department lives, uh, easier for our constituents to be able to find the information that we're looking for, and then also uh, really modernize the look of Polk County. You know, we've been recently in a bit of a, a shift as far as our dig digital presence, what we look like, our branding. Caleb has had a big hand in that. Um, and so really it was about updating our site and making sure that Polk County on a digital level, at least looks like we're in the 21st century. Um, all of those three things are very much a progress that is, uh, still kind of living and existing, you know, as we move forward, we learn more and more about, uh, behavior from users. We have analytics that keep track of where people are going, the paths that they're taking to get information so that we can 
and study that, to use that to improve the site, to make you know changes if needed. Because uh, like I said, everything is very much in a live process. Uh, we want the site not to remain static and stagnate and kind of you know deteriorate over time. And that goes, you know, not only for us as users, uh, we'll be looking at and as we progress in the future, new tools and new ways to do things on the website for different divisions and departments. And uh, I kind of already brushed on like for users, you know, analyzing their behavior, editing the site to make everything uh, more user friendly for them. And then also as we move forward, make visual design changes to make sure that we're still keeping that modern edge. Um, I'm gonna actually pull that up quick. Have it. Yep. So this is our the look of our current site. We have tabs up here. They're broken into all of our government stuff in the government tab. Kind of quick links over here for residents, quick links for businesses, and then also quick links over here for potential tourists, people who are kind of outside the county. Um, the design philosophy behind that was businesses within Polk County. You know, residents within Polk County, external kind of audiences, and then all of the government stuff uh, in that one tab. And then we also have the how do I over here that contains quick links to different forms, uh, highly, you know, asked questions and stuff. Uh, we have quick links down here for kind of hot topics and stuff. So as elections begin to wrap up in, you know, the come this month and the coming weeks and stuff, uh, you'll see some information down here as we continue to look at analytics start to swap out. You know, we look at what pages are getting the most attention right now and put a little spotlight on those by including them down there. Um, we also have quick links here for live, work, and play. I believe the live takes you to just a quick blurb about like living in Polk County with some statistical demographic back. <laughs> work takes you over to uh, our employment opportunities where uh, Polk County posts all of our job listings within Polk County. And then the play is a quick link to an amazing tool that we have over in environmental services. That's the rec viewer. So that has on it, like all of our trail stuff, all of our like bodies of water for fishing, uh, places you can hunt different parks and stuff. Um, down here we have latest news that, uh, is posted not only, uh, from me. So my, a part of my job is also providing press releases on behalf of the county, but also uh, from CSD. So Caleb also does a lot of press releases, a lot of kind of social media posts about different activities and programs that are going on uh, in CSD. Down here we have our upcoming events calendar. That's again, Caleb does a lot of work on that for CSD and CSD events. We also have our meeting information on there. And then finally, down at the bottom, we have a welcome from the county board and then quick links to resolutions, and then our YouTube, our latest minute recordings are kept. So I think unless any of you have any questions for me, that kind of covers my overview and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Yes, so I'm happy. Um, so like Claire did mention, between her and Caleb, a lot of work on it. Caleb did work directly with um, the department. So if you wanna just go to the yeah. like community services, it has a very similar look to what the county one has here. Um, before we had different formats for all of our different departments. So this really helps streamline it and pull it all together. So the same thing, kind of that quick links. We have our different departments, public health, behavior health, economic support, children's and families, and then our general resources right there. So those link to those different departments. The resources can focus on, um, we have a CSD navigator. Um, so she helps with people applying for health care or connecting them to other resources, both within our department, the county, and then outside entities. And same kind of thing layouts, if you scroll down, the welcome, the latest news, and then the calendar of events. Um, so when Caleb had, we worked a lot with the different directors, departments to make sure we're up and doing this. So same like Claire said, we really want to make sure we're keeping these up to date, adding new stuff to engage our community to be looking at these resources we have out there. And I don't know if you, and if you click on the different departments, then it's when it gets into the specifics about kind of those hot topics are going on right now. You know, we have services, COVID, how to reach out to us. If there's any other health alerts, which in the summer that can include like if there's algae blooms in any of the lakes, that's where that stuff is located. Um, 
So and the other websites are all similar for our department, all the different departments. So, oh, yeah. So another fun thing that we can do in the new website that we couldn't before is if there's something important that we want to catch people's eyes, we can do a pop up. So right there we have our health assessments. So we have that popping up on there so that can draw attention to get people to click on it to then be able to get linked right to where to do that. And what are you guys seeing for traffic on both our site and then the overall county site? I would say that would be great. Yeah, so I was actually looking at the analytics yesterday. I don't have exact numbers that I can provide to you guys today, but uh, I mean, we've seen a massive, it's funny, it, on the weekends, you can always tell because the traffic always kind of drops a little bit. It's a little stagnant, but on weekdays, I mean, we're seeing like numbers. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm really just pulling from memory here, but I want to say that we had over the last month, like, uh, I want to say like 20,000, like different page via visits and stuff. I, I could be entirely wrong. Oh, but tons more than before. Uh, I, I would. I haven't looked at the old numbers actually, but I can provide that to you guys. That's okay. I just hear them. But yeah, yeah, um, a lot of traffic. Yeah, and then with CSD, we do have different Facebook pages. We always kind of had one for public health, but we created one specific for CSD as a whole. So I know we're really trying to that social media page that to increase those numbers. And we have an Instagram. We're looking at revamping on the public health side too. Um, so trying to get that information out there, which then would help direct people back to our website where there's more resources. Because you don't on Facebook, you want to keep it quick, grab the attention, and then direct them back over here. So I guess, yeah, take a look. Um, I know we have our board on here. We put our annual reports, um, keep that updated. Um, yeah, resources we link to, we have things like the, I know West Cap is listed on here um, and the other resources that we have available. <coughs> Trying to do it in as few as clicks possible, right? You don't want to have to click 15 times to get to where you're going. So I don't know what the right, yeah, it's really the right number of clicks, Claire. Yeah. 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 So yeah, it's, yeah. So like I said, work in progress. We're really just trying to make sure we're getting that information, keeping it. If there's new things going on, make sure we're sharing. Really good. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. It was mostly Caleb, so I can't really take credit. Thank you for that. Wow. For Caleb and Claire, yeah, thank you so much. Okay, here's, yeah. Can I add the COVID or the health department update? Yes, please. please. If you have had a request, let me just put that in right. Um, and Helen was going to come today, but she has a sick child at home, so we really want her home to keep her kiddo. Yeah. Um, so they showed you the community health needs assessments. Mm -hmm. Please complete that if you haven't. It closes on the 18th of this month. Is that the same one that people got in the drive-through? Yeah. Okay. Um, they'll have a community forum at Luck Lions Club from 5.30 to 7.30 on the 10th. It's this, this Thursday. Monkeypox numbers, Wisconsin has a total of 87 cases. Minnesota has 233, none reported and confirmed in Polk County at, at the time of 7.30 a.m. Um, community level is low for COVID transmission. And we do have our, I think it's our final um, COVID vaccine drive through. Um, this is an encore presentation. Uh, and, yeah, we uh, filled up on the last Moderna and we've had a lot of calls. So we want to respond to that public demand. Um, we're doing this encore on Thursday and um, nine to two, still many slots open. So spread the word if somebody's looking for a booster. Um, just statistically, we have 55% of residents have. Um, completed the initial series, 31% have received an additional booster, and um, Polk County residents 65 plus who have received additional boosters, 66%. We're doing it down to the age of six, correct? Yes, um, the Moderna is allowable now down to age six. We've opened it up for that population. I believe there was one other yeah, or zero many. other. I don't think any other ones went down. Um, facilities in Polk County offering it zero in Burnett County. So we're going to offer that opportunity for kiddos that want the Moderna. Moderna only. No flu shots. How about flu vaccine? Uh, how's that going? Uh, so we had, was it two, four successful drive throughs uh, People were offered COVID and flu shots, high dose, regular, 
um, record number of shots given per group. Most people took both. And then we're finishing up the schools tomorrow, I believe, our school program traveling to the different districts and um, getting kids two shots. No COVID in the schools. So no COVID vaccines. Oh, how about RSV? Yeah. I don't have the numbers for that. Um, we'd have to get, get that for you. Well, yeah, it's good news that the um, uh, yeah, COVID numbers in Pocahontas are low because nationally, um, we're still registering 400 to 500 deaths a day. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, be aware of that when you're traveling, you know, in close spaces that you should wear a mask. Because right? it's, 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 the epidemic is not over. We still do have the testing five days a week in the highway facility. Um, it got cold. The tests don't work well when it's cold out. So we moved them back to the highway shop Monday through Friday, 9 to noon, I believe it is. Right, you guys? I believe it's 9 to noon. It's on the website. It is on the website. <laughs> <laughs> Two clicks away. Beautiful. <laughs> Two clicks away. Two clicks away. Okay. Um, Thank you for adding that. I think we just have that on our agenda. Yeah, that's supposed to be a standard. I, I, I missed it too. Yeah. Okay, so number 13 is subject matters to the next meeting. In addition to an infection disease update, what do people have? We'll have the GLAM update. Anything else burning? Uh, maybe, do you think, John? Yeah, I think if we could have an agenda item for uh, 2023 budget review um, at the division. You know, Right, for the departments, agencies to report out to HHS, that would be good. And then if we have uh, end of year financials for 2021, we'll try to give you a concise read on that. Anyone else? Yes, Steve. Mm -hmm. As well, for budget review. I, so that's we would just be doing CSD, well, anything that feeds up to HHS, so okay. review by definition. Not a suggestion, but a question where we kind of identified what we want to make sure is being addressed in housing initiatives yeah. and things like that. Do we want to include that as yeah. an ongoing conversation? Yeah. Especially yeah. since it sounds like something is being proposed yeah. next week. Yeah. yeah. So depending on what happens there, we'll have a conversation with you guys here about any additional feedback or anything. Would you want, pardon me, Madam Chair, would you want whatever is Put out at the committee next week to them. Are you want, asking that that be placed on this agenda? If it is something that would the timing be on that, what would the calendar look like? Um, it would be in December. Would, would it be before the board meeting? Mm -hmm. What would be well, in December? Well, <clears throat> oh. We're not going to make the timing, are we? I'm just wondering. I think the intent of the resolution is to engender discussion, but right. not to get to a conclusion quickly, as I'm understanding it from the supervisor. Is that your understanding? That's well? my understanding, okay. yes. That's what I I'm saying. So, a, I don't think this is a, like a let's slam it through, okay. uh, you know, on the uh, November 15th meeting. I think it's let's get this topic back in discussion. Would you agree with that? I, 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 I believe so. Yeah. Could we do um, when that comes, I don't know what one point out of Gen Gov or something, can it get to this committee in an e form of an email right away? Whenever it's Ready to Whenever be sent out. Done with that committee that it come to this committee right away. Sure. Yeah. And then because obviously I don't see why not. Okay. Yes. I mean it touches everything. So yeah, the, the issue. And in a in a similar way, and I don't know if this is something that Anna should even be talking about right now. And so it's clear that the purpose of that last committee wasn't slammed through either. The discussion at Gen Gov to get that resolution created and brought before the board. Uh, at our last board meeting was also for discussion purposes, no intent of jamming through or anything. That was the discussion that was had. So that's why it was a little disappointing that it got killed beforehand, because it was the same spirit of create the resolution and have the discussion of the whole board because Jen Gunn had discussed, we don't feel comfortable uh, moving it forward as this group, so let's bring it to the whole group. But that's a different discussion. Yeah, I, get, I get the knowledge, awareness, well, I think that's going to be on us yeah, to, to be. 
full sure. you know, stuff that we get together and make ourselves armed with that information. And presented at the big board. Because right, because right. we have the voice on the floor. Either at the same time that the proposals put in, or meeting before, but then you got yeah. Okay. Okay. Can we before we adjourn? We have been pending. Uh, we said we would move our agenda, our time of start. First, we talked about eight thirty. Then we moved it back to nine for a couple months. We're at the end of those two months. Are people ready to go back to 8.30? Are staff ready to go back to 8.30? I think there was some competition with this room for jury selection if you do the 8.30 time. So um, Shabana thought maybe when we move back across the street, we could okay, go so that's what you meant by that. Should be something Are you okay relatively that? soon? Brian, yeah. That's too early. Dr. Brian. Are you going to summer me? Out of, out of necessity, I'm okay with it. I mean, if I'm, I'm working. Right. So right. earlier... Unless anybody wants to meet that in the evening, the earlier the better for me. So it sounds like we can't meet earlier. How about yeah, if we are in the other building by December meeting, we'll have it. Well, December meeting at, is at DAM. Oh, yeah, at DAM. Oh, okay. we can go to DAM. Are they okay with that? Yes, yeah, that's okay. it. I just said, okay. I'm not trying to throw a wrench in the gears or anything. I'm just saying, like, just for like, working a nine to five job. I, <laughs> grand scheme of things, even outside of me moving forward for the future of the county, for people to be able to participate, these things can't be in the middle of the day. <laughs> Madam Chair, point of information for supervisors if you would like to have a print version of the uh, budget draft. I have one for you. If you prefer to get it via email, we can get it to you via email. Uh, it might not be in color. That might not be in my five separate emails. And, but if you would like to take one of these with you, I can equip you with one on your way out the door. That's why I was pitching. Uh, Many uh, citizen members can have one. We, we're looking for anybody that wants, but we, right now we have one copy for each board member that's in the room. Anyone else? Can, your share okay, email. There's all kinds of ways we can get it to people. <laughs> okay, do share points and send it to us in email. And, and then also, if people want to grab them, grab them. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Oh, 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 what? I'm well, where did we land on the eight yeah, thirty or the nine? Yeah, point of yeah, clarification uh, on your time schedule. For, 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 for example, your AMA meeting is going to be at what time? Nine. I will confirm with Dana Reese that eight thirty would work for her. Okay. And we'll send out put it in a bigger. So bowl, look right? at your agendas at the time uh, and the location. Now this is the time to start paying attention to location because in the next month or two we're going to be moving. So watch that. And apparently we have to update it much earlier. Yeah. yeah, Dr. Loggins is saying it's too early. Early. But there it is too early. You might get yeah. outvoted. Huh? I like to sleep. Yeah, I think Oh, I'm sure so she's going to sleep in the tubes again. Nine is good. Nine is good. Even for retired people, nine is good. There are a lot of other things that you know we're doing during the day, so I would like to get it out of the way early rather than late. Yeah. Nine, nine, nine is a good okay. time for money. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's it's an hour earlier than you got on. Okay. All right. So nine o'clock. We'll yeah. stay with nine o'clock. We are damn next month. And I take half an hour to get there. Now I will take a look at the journey. Thank you, everybody.